This is the Thoughts from a Page podcast, where I interview authors about their latest works. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books. If you have any comments or feedback for me, feel free to contact me through my website, thoughtsfromapage.com. For more book recommendations, follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page, and on Twitter at burn555555. Today, I am interviewing Lisa O'Halloran-Schwartz. Lisa grew up in Washington, D.C. after an early childhood overseas. She attended Harvard University and then medical school at University of Virginia. While in medical school, she won the Henfield Transatlantic Review Prize for her short fiction and also published her first novel, Near Canaan. She specialized in emergency medicine, eventually returned to writing, and published her second novel, The Possible World, in June 2018. Her third novel, What Could Be Saved, just published last week. She currently lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and is at work on the next book. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome, Lisa. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm so excited to have you here. I just recently finished reading What Could Be Saved, and I thought it was outstanding, so I'm really looking forward to talking about it. Thank you so much. It's so great to hear. Well, I usually start out with asking authors to just tell me a little bit about their book. So why don't we do that? You can just kind of give me the short rundown on what could be saved. Okay. Um, What Could Be Saved is my third book. It's a novel about an American family who are living in Bangkok during the American participation in the Vietnam War. And their young son vanishes there without a trace. And then decades later, a man appears claiming to be that child. Well, I was so curious as I was reading it, where you came up with the subject matter for it. Oh my gosh. Well, the very core of the book is my childhood, which was partly spent in Bangkok. It was a lovely childhood and none of the events in this book are real. They're all fictional. But I actually wrote the very nidus of the book as a short story when I was in medical school. And I just started writing fiction. I'd always been a poet up until that point. And I just turned to fiction at the beginning of medical school. And I wrote a story called The Driver. And it was about one specific incident that actually was based in reality in my memory. And it was a nostalgia piece. I was writing a piece that was just drenched in nostalgia for the lovely childhood that I'd had in Bangkok. And then when I revisited the piece just a few years ago, wanting to expand it into a novel, I brought a different goal to it. It wasn't wasn't any longer trying to reproduce that nostalgic feeling of childhood. I wanted to tell a story. And so I added a lot to that little 16-page short story that it started out as. Well, I felt that your descriptions of Bangkok and the heat and the humidity, I mean, I just was like warm as I was reading (laughs) because you brought that to life so well. And the other thing that I was fascinated by when they go back later is that Bangkok seemed like it changed a lot between when they lived there in 72 and when they were going back later. Did that really happen in Bangkok that a lot was torn down and rebuilt? Oh, yes. It's a completely different city. I mean, my memory is just like the character Laura's memory is of temples and grass and small roads and lots of klongs and these canals that ran through the city. And they filled in a lot of the klongs. There's really not very much grass anymore. It's almost space age looking. It's it's beautiful city, very beautiful, but it's clearly a different century in Bangkok now than it was when I was there as a child. Well, I love books that bring settings to life where I feel like I'm literally transported there. And I felt like you did that so well for both 1972 Bangkok and then present day Bangkok. But I was just kind of fascinated in what is that 50 years that the cities had such a wild transformation? Oh, it's it's amazing. I I honestly, we spent a little time in Hong Kong as well. And that also, I mean, it's just enormously different. I have old photos from a beach area that we went to is in in southern Thailand, I have old photos that my father took. And if you look at that same stretch now, it's completely built up. It was a few low buildings on the stretch of sand. And now that same area is just built up with high rises. The whole country's really transformed as far as I can tell. I don't know the whole country that intimately, but the parts I've seen and the parts I remember are 
very different now. I mean, it's moved into the 21st century, like, like a lot of the rest of the world. Well, that's true. And 50 years is a long time. But it just was kind of interesting to me that there had been such a radical transformation. It is. And I also think that people cherish these notions of the unspoiled, lovely Southeast Asia. And I, there's plenty, there are plenty of places in Southeast Asia and, and across the world that are unspoiled. But Bangkok is a major city. And to think of it in a quaint, charming Asian way is, doesn't capture the real present day city. Well, and that makes sense. And I didn't know that the climate was that warm and humid. I just loved that because I just felt like I learned so much about Bangkok. And I just loved that I felt like I was transported to Bangkok. And I felt like I learned so much about Bangkok then and Bangkok now. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Because of course, every time you write a book, and it's not 100% your life, you always worry that you're going to come off as a fraud or that someone's going to point out a giant hole. You had something terribly wrong. So I've been really thrilled that some people, especially some people who know Bangkok well, have given me some nice feedback. And it's it's just been so reassuring. Well, and the other thing that resonated with me, I lived in Rio in Brazil when I was in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So it was the late 70s. And some of what you described in Bangkok was similar to our life in Rio in terms of having the help and sort of learning to navigate a different culture and the things that would happen, what you needed to know, and just kind of generally what it was like to live there. So I really enjoyed that too, because it brought back a lot of memories for me. Yeah, I think expatriate life marks you, I think, in a very pleasant way. I have some friends that I didn't even know they were expatriates until we'd already become really fast friends. There's just a, it's a lovely life. And what you say about the culture and having to adapt to the culture, in my book, the family does not adapt to the culture. They did what some people did when we were there, which was they stayed apart and they tried to recreate their home culture in Bangkok, which we did know people who did that, and it always felt like such a waste. My mother was the exact opposite of that. We were very interested in the culture. I, I feel like I was lucky that way, that my parents had that attitude. My parents were the same way, and so we took advantage of traveling all over Brazil, all over most of South America as we came and went on home leave. I agree with you, and I I thought that was an interesting point that you made. You know, I was young, but I know we took advantage of where we were and learning a lot about the culture. The other thing I thought was so interesting was Genevieve, the mom's insistence on giving them all American names. Yeah, that, that was utter fiction. I don't know anyone who actually did that, but I found it so amusing, and I found that it conveyed something very quickly about her attitude toward being in this foreign country. It was that she was stubbornly going to change things to reflect her own experience, which is a fault, a, a real fault of hers, I believe. I agree completely. And I think it immediately gives you a sense that she is wishing she were still at home and is, like you said, recreating her own life from home versus trying to adapt to the new culture. But I just thought how kind of mind boggling that someone would come in and just feel comfortable renaming everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. And I also, it was very intentional that the children use the Thai names among themselves because the children don't have any, any culture they're trying to force onto their experience in Thailand. They're just experiencing Thailand. So they call the disturbance by their names. Well, and I felt really sorry for the children because they were pretty much left to their own devices even before Philip goes missing. They are just kind of left to their own and no one's really paying much attention to them except sometimes the servants, especially after Philip goes missing. Those poor girls, they just didn't have anyone to guide them. Oh, absolutely. But that actually, I think that's very realistic about the time. Things have really changed about parenting, and I don't have any comments about whether or not that's better or worse. I do know we were much freer in our lives growing up in that era, and I think it was beneficial, and it also, as you say, it was also uh, kind of terrible. <laughs> Well, I mean, I agree. I grew up in that time and definitely we had a lot more freedom, but my parents also knew my friends and knew what was going on and did stuff with us. And I mean, I felt like Genevieve and Robert were the more hands off than most parents. That does not reflect my experience of my parents. My parents really, when I tried to create Genevieve and Robert, I thought of things that were absolutely opposite to my parents and gave them those qualities 
there are some qualities that are similar to my parents, but I think not very specific qualities. But the fact that Genevieve did not want to be in Bangkok, that is the exact opposite of my mother's experience. She was very upset when we came home. She wanted to stay there forever. My father was very uh, quiet, like Robert, but there wasn't that sense of that overall sense of neglect. I think that's exactly the right expression for it is neglect, that they were hands off, but to the point that it was neglect versus just that kind of standard 1970s parenting style, which was more hands off than today. It's true. But I will say we were sometimes transported alone by the driver places. And my, it wasn't my mother's choice. There was a time when I went to school that I was really, really unhappy. When Every time they left me at school, I would cry. And my mother asked me once, what, what can I do to make you not cry? And I told her, I don't mind leaving you, but I can't bear to watch you leave me. So after that, she sent me to school with the driver. Oh, it's just so sad to think of. And I, I was perfectly happy I was a, to go to school. I loved the school. I loved my friends there. And there was something about seeing my mother drive away that was upsetting to me. And so my mother, I just remember her throwing up her hands and saying, fine, I will send you alone in a car with the driver. Well, what kind of school did you go to when you were in Bangkok? Well, I did go to the school that's described. It's Bangkok Patna School. It was a fabulous school. It it was on Soi Naveen then in Bangkok, and now it's moved to another spot. But it's a British private school, and it's still there, just lovely. And I can't tell you how much I enjoyed my time there. I wrote stories there. I have delightful stories still that I wrote in little in little blue books there. They had little blue books. Well, tell me a little bit about your research for this one. Like what, I mean, obviously you lived there originally, and it sounds like you've been back, but what other kind of research did you do? Oh, you know, so much. I was so young when I was there, and my memories are just really a pinhole on Bangkok. I was a child. We were actually fairly protected. We didn't roam Bangkok by any means. I needed to try to see old Bangkok from an adult's perspective, and I had also had to bolster my own memories as a child. So what I did is I read a lot of nonfiction. I gathered oral histories and memoirs that even glanced on Bangkok. I read a lot of really great books, very obscure books, I think, but they would have a section or a passage or a paragraph that just reported some aspect of Southeast Asia or Bangkok and in that era. And, and it really just went into my brain. I, I would put those little pieces into my brain and let them sort of macerate for a while. Also about rural Thailand, because one of the characters is from rural Thailand. I actually had a whole section in rural Thailand that got cut out because it really didn't serve the story. And I also read some military history to inform the spy element of the story. I found books of old maps of Bangkok, which I have, which they're lovely, and old picture books. And believe it or not, YouTube was wonderful. There were a lot of soldiers on r r people who visited Bangkok, who uploaded, they took old footage and they, they somebody is uploading it to to YouTube. Many people have just uploaded these little memories. They're fragments. A lot of times they have no sound, but you can see what the vehicles were like, what the people were wearing. There's just a sense that you, a visual sense that you can't get from words. And so I put all of that into my brain. And before I would write, I would just let it melt around in there so that eventually I would have a f familiar pool that I could draw on when I try to create a scene. And I have a very good friend who's a poet. His name is Bobby Cottle Rogers. And he told me something years ago that I never forgot, which is he can tell the difference between a writer who knows three facts about a subject and puts them into a story and a writer who knows a hundred facts and chooses three. So I think that for some reason, we were very young when he told me that, and it just went right into my soul. And I've really tried hard to learn a lot about what I'm writing about and in that way, I have a, a range of facts to choose from. Well, that explains, I think, why you were able to bring it so vividly to life, because I think observing those things many different ways, reading them, seeing them, gives you sort of the full picture, which then I think you portrayed very effectively. Thank you so much. I think smell is the one thing that I didn't have to bolster because sense of smell is so important to me. So I really remember how old Bangkok smelled. 
Well, what happened with me as I was reading your book, I will usually be reading a nonfiction book and a fiction book at the same time. And I was reading Come Fly With Me by Julia Cook, which is about Pan Am and kind of the history of Pan Am and their involvement in the Vietnam War. And it comes out in March. And it was so interesting because there was such an overlap in the two stories, which doesn't frequently happen to me. She spends a while talking about the time spent by some of the soldiers for R and R in Bangkok, and this I am intercontinental. I think was mentioned in your book. Was also mentioned in that book. So it was just kind of interesting to me that I these two very different books, but had some definite overlaps. Oh, that is so interesting. I have to read that book now. Thank you for mentioning it. It's fascinating. I'm almost done with it. And it is also a page turner. And I have just thoroughly enjoyed it because when we lived in Rio, we flew Pan Am. So as soon as I saw that that book was coming out, I knew I needed to read it. And it's, it's, I had no idea that Pan Am had had a role in transporting soldiers to Vietnam, but then also transporting them on these kind of annual R&R trips to various places in Asia. I know a very little bit about that, and I would love to know more. So I'm really grateful for the recommendation. And it's a stellar cover, as we're going to get ready to talk about your cover, because I'm always all about covers, and I absolutely love your cover. And same with the Pan Am book. They're both just very eye-catching. But why don't we talk a little bit about your cover and how it came about? Sure. Well, the, Atri- the team at Atria came up with this design. And when you write a book and you're waiting for them to come up with a cover, you're very scared because you think, oh my God, what if they come up with something just... I can't stand. <laughs> I don't I don't think I have the formal official right to object to anything. I don't think it's in the contract. I trust my agent, she tells me. She just says it's good sign it. But uh, what I found out is that Atria was really more than willing to meet me halfway and they came up with a design which I loved so that we were great off the bat. But then I nitpicked at them about the shade of the blue and the font and they were really responsive. I mean surprisingly responsive to me, because I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not a designer, but I, it was just color. I wanted it to be not as quite a light color blue, because I felt that that was too cheerful. I wanted to communicate when you look at the book, some sense that there is a, a darker element to the story, that this isn't just a, a silly book. Not that they were making a silly cover, but the light blue with a jaunty font made, felt a little bit lighter than I felt the book really is. And they made the butterfly gold, which was so just a lovely surprise. It's all shiny, so pretty. And I love the butterfly design. I, I love the, the whole design, but I love the butterfly part of it because to me, the butterfly communicates fragility. And it also communicates that concept of the, you remember the Ray Bradbury story where the man steps on a butterfly I was like, I don't remember that particular story. I love him and I've read a lot of his books or a lot of his stories, but I don't remember that one. I believe it's a Ray Bradbury story in which people are taking tours to the to the remote past and it's a prehistoric tour and they're told you can't get out of the vehicle. You can only look because what you do may affect things enormously down the line. And somebody gets out and steps on a butterfly. And then when they get back to their own time, it's just incredibly different. The, everything is different about the the present day. And I think that's Ray Bradbury. I read it in high school, so I might be wrong about the author. But it that always stuck with me. And I think it's a pretty well-understood concept that a really tiny change can cause an enormous effect. And I think that's in this book too, these little secrets that some of them are bigger and some of them are smaller, but they sort of come together to affect the future of this family. I thought that the person who designed it just really understood the book maybe better than I did. (laughs) Well, the ripple effect definitely plays a role in your book. And I think also the thing that stuck with me was that everybody has their own view and memory and I guess idea of what happened. And so when you get to the end and they're looking back, everybody realizes, oh, I only have my perspective. I wish I'd had your perspective also, or I'd understood where someone else was coming from. So I think you're right. The butterfly to me is fragility, but also hope that the butterfly sort of just made me think of of the way it all ends. Well, yes, that the butterfly can, can fly above the chaos if it's lucky enough. It communicates not only fragility, as you say, but also a sense of optimism, that there's something beautiful, even if it's small and you have to look for it, there's something beautiful 
in in everything. That I really think I want to communicate to my readers that there's while my books might make them cry, there is an overarching optimism to the story. Well, and it's interesting to me because I do think covers tell a story and the very first impression is incredibly important. But also once you've read a book, you can look back and realize, oh, there's even more to this cover than I realize, which is definitely the case with yours as we're sitting here talking about it. So it sounds like they just completely hit it out of the ballpark. I feel like they did. Sometimes an artist can interpret something and see things that you didn't even know you were saying. And I feel like the art department at Atria did that. They went beyond the obvious for this cover. And I'm glad it seems striking to you. I love it. The cover tells you something about the book. So the art department is just hugely, I I don't want to say powerful, but they just have a huge responsibility and they can do such wonderful things to communicate to the reader, you, this is a book you want to read. So I, I just really love that. I agree completely. And the other thing I just hate is when I finish a book and then I look at the cover and I'm thinking, I don't understand this cover compared to the book at all. Either the person in the book is blonde and the hair is dark or the wrong time period, whatever it is. And so it always makes me very happy when everything matches up. And then, like you said, we can sit here and kind of dissect it afterwards and realize that the looks like art and the font and the butterfly. I, I just think that's outstanding. Atria really did do a wonderful job. It did. It made me. It made me so happy. They really understood my book. <laughs> so nice. Well, we talked a little bit about this because you said you had written a short story and then you chose to expand it into this book. But how long did it take you once you decided to do that to write this book? Oh my lord, that's such a hard thing because I make a lot of false starts with this book and with my previous book, The Possible World. I made a lot of false starts because I was trying to figure out sort of the premise, not really the premise, but the impetus of the book, the core of the book. But once I actually sat down to write this book and disregarding the years I macerated in research, just because I was interested in Bangkok, so I knew all that stuff and read all those books. Once I really started to write, it didn't take too long, maybe a few months. Wow. This is before the pandemic, obviously. I could write for hours in a coffee shop. I have to come home and walk my dog. But I could go and and just really have no responsibilities for many hours, maybe four or five hours at a time. And a lot of people don't have that luxury. And once the draft was done, that's just the beginning for me. I revise. A lot of the writing is done in revision. I revise a lot because the writing process for me is a very free-flowing experience. And I often have no idea where I'm going with it. And later I have to revise a lot to make it make sense, to work with the plot. So it's a very inefficient process, but the initial rough draft was pretty quick. I hear a lot of authors say that because they want to just get something down initially and then a lot of their better work comes in revision. Yes, I think for me, it was a real problem. I have a real perfectionism. (laughs) At one point, I don't know, a couple decades ago, my agent told me, you're such a perfectionist. And I said, no, I'm not because I'm not perfect. And I was absolutely serious. But now I understand that my perfectionism was hampering me because I wanted everything to be perfect as I went along. And it was very difficult to learn how to just kind of leave nonsense and chaos behind me. And the only thing that saved me was actually software. I highlight a passage or something I don't like. I just highlight it and write a digital note, a digital sticky that says, fix this. And so as I write, it allows me to write knowing that I'll come back to it. When I write a draft, as I revise, I will get up to something like 6,000 notes. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's really ridiculous, but it's delightful because it's the only way I could write past the chaos is to know that I've marked that spot and my entire draft will be blue with the highlighting. And then I will go back and I will just eliminate one by one. And all of those digital stickies are really telling me, they say things like fix and arg and yuck, <laughs> but what, they, what they're saying, or, and sometimes they have more reasonable things. They actually say, consider this, or should this be a different word or should this be a different color or whatever. But most of the time it's just ick. And it's telling me this isn't right. You need to fix it. And when I go through as I do more revisions, there are more and more notes. It just multiplies. 
to the point where it's almost impossible to open the document. And that's when I'm at the tipping point and I have to start making decisions and removing the stickies. It's a ridiculous way to work, but I'm so grateful for software because it allows me to leave all kinds of imperfect nonsense in the document, which is absolutely necessary in order to get the shape, the structure and shape of the book. And then you can, then I can focus on the language and all the rest later in the many, many revisions that I do. Well, I think the most important thing is that you found a system that works for you. And I think everybody just has to work with what they have and know what's important to them and how they want to get it down. And it sounds like you've done that very well. I'm so, I feel so grateful. Without this software, I would be on one page for the rest of my life. (laughs) I do a little bit of that when I write a couple of book articles for a Houston magazine. And I'll do a little bit of that. Like I'll get hung up on language in a sentence and I just kind of do the same thing, but mine's much more basic because it's not nearly as long. I'll just highlight an area and then say, come back to it and then just keep going. And then most of the time as I'm writing something else, the word or the phrase I was looking for, for up above comes to me and I just go back up there. That's exactly right. That's exactly what what it's like. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. And before we wrap up, I would love to hear what you have read recently that you really liked. Well, I've been reading less than usual during the pandemic, but I have read this beautiful book, Long Bright River by Liz Moore. It's a police procedural. I don't read detective stories in general. It transcends that genre, although there's nothing wrong with that genre. It's just so beautiful. It's beautifully written. It's profound. It was a great read. I loved Dear Edward. I think a lot of people have talked about that. That's a beautiful book. Love that book. That was one of my favorite reads of 2020. Mine too. It just, I mean, it was just stunning to me. And I recommended it and everyone I recommended it just adored it. And then a nonfiction book called Clutter, an Untidy History has really, I, I have a little tiny bit of a hoarding tendency by which I mean I just don't want to get rid of something in case it's useful. And I've had to fight that tendency a lot. And Clutter is by uh, Jennifer Howard, who's a journalist. And she had to clean out her elderly mother's house. And it led to a history of just stuff, how we accumulate it, how we deal with it, how the culture handles it, as well as her own personal history of dealing with this sort of hoard in her mother's house. It's a really slim little book. And it's just, the writing is just delightful. And I also have reread a book, which I don't do very often, but life is short. But there's a book called All the Ever Afters by Danielle Teller. And it's the retelling of Cinderella from the point of view of the evil stepmother. It's not magical. It's a, it's a historical novel. And it's just, it's really lovely. It's beautifully written and it's kind of like a warm blanket. <laughs> so I reread that recently. I've never even heard of that one. I'm going to have to look it up. It sounds very interesting, and I love historical stories. So that sounds like it'd be right up my alley. It's just, it's really beautiful. It's got a really lovely cover. Speaking of cover art, it's just very eye-catching. And I, I just really enjoyed it. And not to give anything away, but when you get to the end, you just think, oh, I'm so glad I read this book. Oh, good. Well, that is quite a recommendation. And dear Edward, I recommended it to everyone. And everybody came back and said, oh, that was such a good book. I'm really glad I read it. And, and in this pandemic, a, a hopeful read is, I think, really welcome. And especially a, a hopeful read that isn't just lighthearted, but also deals with sadness. And Dear Edward, I think, does that so beautifully. It, it has a really sad situation, but it handles it so delicately and so beautifully. And you're left feeling really optimistic. So it's a great pandemic book. It definitely is. Well, I really, really appreciate your time, Lisa. I enjoyed speaking with you so much about what could be saved. And I appreciate that you came on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really lovely. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I want to correct a title that I reference in this episode. I called it Come Fly With Me, but in fact, it's Come Fly the World, the book about Pan Am by Julia Cook. It will be out in March. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram and Pinterest at Thoughts From a Page. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it wherever you listen to your podcasts. Lisa's book can be purchased at Murder by the Book, where I work part-time, and the link is in the show notes. Thanks to KP Regan for the sound editing, and I hope you'll tune in next time. Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, 
a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. Our ninth season is coming this fall. Tune in to hear from some of the all-time great authors, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and more. Subscribe to Novel Conversations wherever you listen to podcasts.